Isn't that wonderful? We rejoice tonight in the goodness of the Lord. And we're so thankful tonight for the invitation to be with you. And Pastor, uh, thank you uh, for this honor to come and be a part of what the Lord is doing here. And Temple Baptist Church, I want to thank you for your faithfulness uh, to the Lord. And then for the vision and the burden uh, to make sure that uh, Crown College is a success. And tonight to the staff of the church and to the church family, we honor you as well tonight as for the faculty of the college and to our graduates tonight, we honor and salute you at your baccalaureate service to celebrate what God has done in your life. And this is a great night, a night of celebration, a night of remembrance. I want you to take your Bible and turn with me, if you would, in the Old Testament to Psalms 78. Psalms 78. I bring you greetings from Trinity Baptist Church in Asheville. And uh, that church family loves you and prays for you. And I noticed that many of the awards given tonight were to Trinity Church members. I love that. So we're grateful to be a part of the student body here and uh, to know that the Lord has put these churches with a similar burden of loving the lost and encouraging the saints and equipping us to serve. And we thank you for your leadership, Pastor, and for your faithfulness. In Psalm 78, the Word of God says in verse number 3, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. Talking about the sayings of old, the parables, the testimonies, the victories, the defeats, the things that families and friends have all gone through in life. And it says in verse 4, having to do with our faith, we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Verse number five, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them. Notice this phrase, would you please? Even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. The class of 2019 is a pivotal class. In my opinion, it's one of the most important classes we've had in modern history. And the reason I make that statement, which is very big and bold, is not so much it's about you the individual or me the individual, but it has to do with where time is located the appointment that we're at, the intersection that we're walking into. Always remember that God tells time quite differently than we do. God doesn't use a Rolex and God doesn't use a Timex. When God's telling time, he tells time with the nation of Israel. Amen. And when God's dealing with the nation of Israel, then you better sit up Pay attention and notice something is taking place. On May 14, 1948, God reached down and he stroked the pendulum of time. And where we had had a lull and where it had been stopped, May 14, 1948, God began the countdown of biblical prophecy. The Bible says that no man knows the day or the hour of the Lord's return. Not even the angels know that. And God knows the way we're wired as Baptists. It would be a bad thing if he even put it in the book. 
because if we could figure it out, Brother Johnny, we'd be in trouble. I mean, if I could figure it out that the Lord's coming back on June the 2nd, 2019, and I could take my MacBook and my computer and my charts and, and I could just paper the wall and put it on the big screen and say, here's the biblical proof, here's all the dispensations of time, here's the intersections, here's the vortex of energy, the synergy of what's about to happen, June 2, he's coming, biblical proof. Do you know what we would do? Nothing till June the 1st. <laughs> then on June the 1st, we're going to have us an old-fashioned revival meeting. <laughs> we're all going to get right with God. We're going to hug our mother-in-law, kiss and make up. Mama, I'm sorry the way I've acted. Your front yard's going to look like a flea market. Lawnmowers will be back. Hammers and saws return. Bill, I don't know how this got in my house. Been there 12 years. And... <laughs> And then you'd be in the pastor's office writing a check. Oh, pastor. <laughs> Mom and I went to the bank this morning. We cashed this CD. Here's 50000 for the college. Here's 50000 for mission. He knows that check's not going to clear. <laughs> Lord's coming in the morning. And, and so God tucked all that away. He hid all that. And he said, I'm not going to allow you to figure out when it's going to happen I'm going to instruct you to watch and to be ready that you live every single day like it could be your last day because no man knows the day or the hour. But what God graciously did and what God has written all through the word of God is that he prepared us. Your education class has been a preparation for the day and hour that you're living in. It is a crazy world that you are graduating and walking out into, but God planned and purposed and prepared you for what you are about to face. God wanted you to know and wants me to know and wants your parents to know and your grandparents to know that this is not the day to play church. This is not the day to sit on the pew and to be idle. This is not the day to be a spectator in the house of the Lord. This is the day to make that commitment. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. This is the day to feel the urgency and the passion that I must draw nigh to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the day that you would determine and understand that I will not trust in religion and I will not trust in ritual. I need a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a denomination in the world that can save you. And there's not a ritual in the world that can prepare you for eternity. The only hope that you have and the only hope that I have is that I have a personal relationship with the loving Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life that I might have life eternal and that you would walk in victory and in faith. You say, well, Pastor Ralph, you don't know the problems I'm walking in. You don't know the circumstances of my life. Well, always remember this, that if you're in a battle, in a struggle, in a valley, in a hard place, it's not so much that God wants to change your circumstance as much as it is that God wants to change you. God wants to make a difference in your life. I remember the struggle that I had walking the hall way there as my precious wife was leaving this world and headed into the next world. And I kept praying for God, please heal her. Please restore her. And I remember walking down that hallway and God spoke to me and he said, Ralph, I understand, but you have to remember, listen, she's not yours She's mine, and I will do what's best for her, not what's best for you. Do you understand what God's doing? Everything we walk through, everything we face, everything that we are uh, involved in, God is using it to equip us. The tough things, the bad things, the hurtful things, the misunderstandings, the disappointments, they're all preparatory. 
when you go through the book of Genesis and we walk through those first 10 or 11 chapters and, and we have in Genesis 1 the creation and then we have the creation in chapter 2 and animation and chapter 3 we have the fall and then we have Cain and Abel in chapter 4 and chapter 5 we have the sons of, of Adam and Eve and in chapter 6 and uh, chapter 7 we see Noah's finding grace in the eyes of the Lord and then we walk down through the flood and the, we walk down and there's a rainbow in the sky and then we get over to chapter 11 and there's chaos and there's rebellion and, and, and we see all of that is in preparation. All of those chapters, 2,000 years by the way, Genesis 1-1 to Genesis 12, but when we get into chapter 12, we're gonna have the birth of the nation of Israel. God's gonna call Adam, uh, God's gonna call Abram out of the Ur of Chaldees and he is using all of these things in the preparation of men that they would be calling upon the name of the Lord. And God said, I'm gonna take a little people group and I'm gonna illustrate grace and I'm gonna illustrate mercy and I'm gonna illustrate principle and I will use this people. And ladies and gentlemen, it was all a preparation. We go to the New Testament and what do we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Those are four Jewish books. Jesus and the disciples, they're walking in faith. But where are they serving? They're walking into the synagogue. They're praying in the synagogue. They're teaching in the synagogue. It's a Jewish book with Jewish customs and Jewish cultures. That's why we spend all the time and energy doing these teaching tours in the Holy Land because this book the, the, the depth and the joy and the revelation and the layers upon layers, it comes alive when you begin to see it in country, in the land, in the custom of 3,000 years ago, in the custom of 2,000 years ago. And so what did Jesus do? He walked with them and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we see him even observing Passover. Can you imagine? His family was religious. Remember what happened when he was 12 years old? His mom and dad, they left Nazareth and they walked all the way from Nazareth down the Jordan Valley, crossed up and went into Jerusalem and there they took him to the temple. Do you remember that? And what was he doing there? He was having his bar mitzvah. He was a religious Jew. His family was religious Jews. And you begin to understand the principle that he's no longer a child. He's in that preparation. God is getting him ready. Just like he's getting this class of 2019, you've had these four years of college. He's got a, you in that preparatory phase. Now you're getting ready to walk out the door. Jesus was in a preparatory phase and his bar mitzvah was there at 13. An amazing time. I wish we had time to talk about what happened because there was three days and three nights after that bar mitzvah that were preparatory for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights without a mama. Three days and three nights without a place to eat or a place to sleep. That was getting ready to happen. His mom and dad forgot him. They were in excitement. What was the custom of the day? The caravan of family, they left Jerusalem, they're celebratory, they're walking, they're talking, and the dads are all together, the men, the women are all together. And, and what does Mary think? She's thinking, you know what? Jesus walked down here with me because he's my boy. I love Jesus. But now he's a young man. He's walking with the men and he's with them as they walk in the caravan home. And what's Joseph thinking? He's saying, oh, I know he celebrated his bar mitzvah. I know he should be walking with the men, but boy, he loves his mama. He's a mama's boy. I know what he's doing. He's walking with mama. He wants to be with her on this walk home. But when they stop the, the encampment and they begin to cook and they break out to get water, Mary walks over to Joseph and said, where's Jesus, darling? And she said, what do you mean, where's Jesus, darling? He's with you. No, no, he's with you. And he was forgotten. And where was Jesus, darling? He was at the house of the Lord. He was at the temple. He was at a preparatory time. He was at a time of education. And what did God do for him in a marvelous, magnificent way? 
God allowed him to be light and salt to all of those intellects, to the scribes, the Pharisees. He was there with the high priest, the priest, the captain of the temple. Always remember that captain of the temple is second only to the high priest and ruling authority. And then the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, and ladies and gentlemen, and here is a 12-year-old boy now celebrating his 13th birthday and he's standing in the midst of them and he's mystifying them. Why? Because he is the book. John said, and the word became flesh. And the word of God was standing inside the temple. The word of God, the living word, the same God that threw stars off his fingertips is the same God that was standing there as a 13-year-old boy in the midst of them, a preparatory time. And boy, I love to talk about that. If we had time tonight, I like to think about what happened when those priests and high priests and the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees began to cross-examine that young man and they began to say, oh, well, uh, how do you know so much about the scripture? How do you know so much about the intent of the law? How can you describe so uh, precisely the book of Isaiah? Well, he dictated it. I guess he knows it. I mean, it's powerful. And you think about that. Can't you just imagine one of those men looking at him and saying, you're, you're so wise. You're, you're amazing. I've never met a child like you. How old are you, son? And he says, well, on my mama's side, I'm 13 years old. But on my daddy's side, I'm older than my mama, and I'm the same age as my daddy. Can you imagine that conversation? Can you imagine when they begin to question him and they say, well, uh, how did you grow up and where are you from? And he said, well, on my mama's side, I had to learn to crawl. And on my mama's side, I had to learn to walk. But on my daddy's side, before there were worlds, I stood with him on the embattlements of heaven and I threw stars and suns and moons off my fingertips because I am the only begotten son of God. Can you imagine that conversation? Can you imagine that day? But it was all preparation. It was all preparation. I don't have time to go through all those things that happened in that 13-year-old conversation as he spoke to those men. But you know what? He's getting ready to go to Calvary. He's getting ready to buy you and to buy me an eternal home. He's getting ready to establish in my heart and your heart a work of grace, marvelous grace. And you begin to see that it's all in preparation just a few hours ago, I stood up on top of, of Mount Carmel. And as I stood there, we overlooked the Jezreel Valley, the Valley of Armageddon. And our group, our group just gathered around on top of the uh, monastery and we overlooked that valley and we began to sing the hymns uh, of the faith. And then I began to talk about the preparation that happened that day there in Jerusalem was getting ready for that final day that's coming and it is approaching and that day that's getting ready to happen when Jesus Christ will come and you'll be with him and I'll be with him and we'll gather there at Jezreel, the valley of Armageddon and there the armies of the world will once again rise up with rebellion in their heart and they will say, we will not bow down, we will not serve you. And Jesus will stand and declare with a clear voice that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And he will speak and the blood will flow to the horse's bridle and there will be victory there. And then he'll tell us to just wait for a moment and he'll step across the Jordan River. He'll walk down over into the rose red city of Petra and there with the blood still dripping off of his vesture, he will be standing there in front of the nation of Israel that's hiding from the wrath of the Antichrist. And the book of Isaiah says that a nation shall be born in a day and they will declare that he is the Messiah Yeshua, the Son of God. All of that is preparation. The preparation that God is doing in your heart, in your life tonight. You think about what God did 
in the book of Acts in preparation. Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, all preparation. There's no more fascinating book than this transition book after we do Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John with all of this Jewish world and Jewish custom. Now we're going to break out and we're going to go into the transition of the grace of God. There will be no grace unless there's a grave and the grave of the Lord Jesus Christ will be the, the tip of the spear that will bring grace to a lost and a dying world. Amen. It will be the piercing of the shining light of, out of the throne room of a holy God where God declares that there's hope for men, there's hope for your life, there's hope for your family, there's hope for your future because Jesus has paid the price and Jesus will be declaring himself but he did preparation for me and for you. What did we find in Acts chapter 8? We got the Ethiopian, and he is fascinated. Can you imagine what went through his mind? He was in Jerusalem when they stoned Stephen. Think about that. And he's with Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, one of the richest women in the world. And this man has the financial authority of the queen. He represents her and he's in Jerusalem and Stephen is stoned and there's a rustle and a bustle in the town. There's a new way of thinking. Why, there's this rebel named Jesus. He declares that he is the son of God and this man, Stephen's a follower of him and they stone him to death but before Stephen dies, he makes a speech. He gives a sermon. He walks them from Abram all the way through the Old Testament. He tells them the history of the Jewish people. And he declares that there is the answer to the one that they prayed for. Yes, you've, you've prayed over and over in the temple. You've prayed for the Messiah. You cried out to him in Hebrew, Baha Mashiach, Baha Mashiach, come, O Messiah. And now he was here and you killed the Messiah. You rejected him. You pushed him away. And they were so incensed and angry that they stoned Stephen. And he was a preparation for them that they could have light for their generation. And when they stoned him, this Ethiopian this treasurer, this man of great prestige and power, he was so moved that he took his money and he went over and he bought a scroll. He bought the book of Isaiah. Listen, no one could afford a scroll. It takes months, years, many times to make a copy of the, uh, one of the books of the Old Testament. And the only people that had them would be the synagogues and, and the schools and, and, and the institutions of higher learning and the extremely wealthy, they could buy one. But you know what? This Ethiopian, he went and bought the book of Isaiah. He leaves Jerusalem, comes down off of the, mount, the backside of Mount Zion, heads down across the desert, and they head down to uh, the coastline, the beautiful Mediterranean coastline there at Gaza, and it hits all over him. God's dealing with him. He's trying to process, is there a God? Is there an answer? Is there a solution for my soul's condition? And finally, he tells his great caravan to pull over. He pulls his mighty chariot up to the side, overlooking the Mediterranean, and he begins to read the book of Isaiah. But God had prepared somebody else. They had just graduated from Bible college. Hey man, a young evangelist full of passion and full of obedience to the sweet Holy Spirit of God. And Philip's down there and all of a sudden what happens? God touches Philip. God touches the Ethiopian and he walks up beside him. And you know he's a rich man. Man, how big is that chariot? He calls him to get up in it. I mean, it's got chrome wheels. It's got, uh, it's got AM, FM. It's got everything. It's a massive, massive, wealthy, listen, chariot. There's nothing like it. They get up in there together, and he says, do you understand what are you reading? He said, how can I unless somebody tells me? And they're all outside tonight 
and they can't understand unless somebody tells them. You're trained. You know how to tell them. You're more articulate than any generation we've ever graduated. You've got the technology. You've got more intellectual capabilities on your cell phone than NASA had the day we put a man on the moon with all of our massive government computers. They cannot even match what you have on your cell phone. You have the technology. You have the ability. You can preach to the world tonight after this service. You can go online. You can go on Facebook. You can Instagram. And the whole world can access your words. You have that ability. No generation has ever had that technology. No generation has ever had that ability. But look at Acts, Acts 8. We've got the Ethiopian and he becomes converted. And, and notice what else happens in Acts 9. We have another man that gets converted. He's, he's a persecutor. He's a tremendous intellect. He's from a very, very wealthy family. Probably had a genius IQ and a photographic memory. No one like Paul. He's an amazing fella. And you that have studied the New Testament, you know that approximately one-fourth of our New Testament, 23% is written. The words are there in the Greek New Testament or off the pen of the Apostle Paul. An amazing, amazing man. Unbelievable with his intellectual proudness. Vocabulary beyond any type of, of debate that was held in his day and hour. No one could touch him. No one could equal him. But he had all this venom and he had all this hate against anyone that would follow Jesus Christ. He literally was born out of season. To be a disciple, you have to see Jesus work with him. And he didn't have that experience till he got to the Damascus Road and God intercepted him and he bore him into a place. And what happened to him? Three days and three nights, no food, no water. He got to taste a little bit about what Christ had just gone through. He was in a dark place, no vision. We forget why, how powerful God is. He wanted Paul to understand eternity. And he took away from Paul his sense of sight. He took away from him his, his ability to drink water. He took away from him his ability to eat food. And he wanted him to see the depraved nature of man. If I don't have God, I have nothing. Amen. Nothing tastes good. Nothing is right and nothing looks right. Nothing feels right. Nothing can be right if I leave Jesus out of my life. And there we see the powerful demonstration of the grace of God. And in Acts 9, Paul's converted, but then something special happens in Acts 10. The apostle Peter, while well, he's down at Joppa, and he's just been down there and God used him in a mighty way and while he was down there up at Caesarea by the sea, we have a centurion, Cornelius of the Italian band. In other words, he's not one that had been conquered in another country and then drafted into the Roman army. He's from the motherland. He is an Italian. He's an Italian in the army. And he's a leader, a centurion, very intelligent, very wealthy. He has a beautiful home. He has servants. And yet God, the Holy Ghost, stopped by his house. And God dealt with him. God, no respecter of person. This same God that's preparing Israel. This same God that's preparing Paul. This same God visits him. And he sends for Peter and Peter comes up. And what do we have in Acts 10? We have the conversion of this man from Italy, Cornelius, and he becomes a believer. And later on in Acts 10, I don't have time to run through here, but the same thing had happened in Acts 2. God did it for the Gentiles in Acts 10. God filled the Jews with the Holy Spirit of God in Acts 2, and he did the same thing for the Gentiles in Acts 10. Why? God's no respecter of person. And the same anointing that I need and you need God is no respecter of person. Listen, 
You can have so many degrees. Your mama calls you thermometer. But if you don't have the power of God on your life, when you walk out that door, it will be vain and empty. We need the power of God for this generation. We need God on us. We need the very evidence that our God's alive and well, that our friends can tell that our God's alive and well, that our mom and dad knows that there's something different with our walk and our talk, that they can see that we have spent time with the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about what God was preparing. Think about this. I'm fascinated with this Bible. And in Acts 8, I've got an Ethiopian. He's a heathen a heathen from Africa. Think about what happened in Acts 9. I've got a Jew, Orthodox, locked up in ritual, all encumbered with law. In Acts number 10, I've got a Gentile. i got a heathen, a Jew, and a Gentile. And then look what God did. The Ethiopians from Africa. What about that? And Paul, he's from the Middle East. He was comfortable in Syria. He was comfortable in Israel. He was comfortable in the Middle East. And then what about Cornelius? He's from Italy. He's from Europe. And what God was establishing in Acts 8, 9, and 10, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every race, to every creed, to every continent. He was saying way back then that when I prepare you, the world is your home to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was preparing them for the church to be born. And out of that book of Acts, we'll see the gospel go around the world. The Ethiopian took the Lord Jesus Christ back to Africa. Cornelius, he took the gospel back to Italy. And we see Paul setting the world on fire as he wrote with an anointed pen and a callous knee as he prayed for the urgency of the hour to be met by the power and demonstration of God. We are that generation. Look what he said here. He said, in the word of God that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children. Ladies and gentlemen as we gather here with the class of 2019 we're facing a generational truth. We are burying the best prayer warriors the church has ever had in America. We're burying men and women of faith every single day. We're the people that prayed and fasted, the faithful tithers. I read one report the other day in a religious magazine that it said it takes seven millennials to make up one of the faithful of the generation that's going on to heaven in prayer and in giving because we're suffering from a lack of commitment. Matter of fact, the fastest growing religion in America is none, N-O-N-E, on every survey. That they're nothing. And you know why they're nothing? Because they've not seen anything out of us. They've not seen us passionate. They've not seen us on fire. I just came back from doing another crusade in Korea and I'll be returning in July and... and, and, uh, Already we have over 4,000 soldiers that have signed up to be baptized on the military base where I preached. 4,000. We're going to baptize them on one Saturday in the month of July. And ladies and gentlemen, you know what I met in Korea? I still can't get away from it every time I go over there to preach is the burden, the dedication they have. They'll be there at 5 o'clock in the morning to pray. 5 o'clock in the morning. And, and then they'll, they'll have another group come in at 6 o'clock in the morning. I, I remember my handler picked me up at the hotel, and, and we went out, we had dinner, and he said, now don't forget, Dr. Sexton, I'm going to pick you up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> he said, we're going to church. I said, you're going to church? 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, no, we we'll have to be at prayer meeting at 5 o'clock. You've got to preach. And, and so I obediently did as instructed. 
and reluctantly and not happy, not even smiling. I got dressed, took a shower and shaved, and I'm down in the lobby at 4 a.m. And they pick me up and they take me to the church. And when I get in the church parking lot at 4.30 in the morning, there's people out in the parking lot with vests on and, and they're smiling and they're waving and motioning, come on in. And, and I got out of the van went to, and the lady's opening the door smiling, welcome to the house of God. Welcome, welcome, bowing and waving and smiling. And when I walk in the auditorium at 4.30, I can already hear people praying and the altar and in the, in the seats, people are praying. And, and by five o'clock in the morning, there's a thousand, there's two thousand, there's three thousand people at five a.m. And, and they're praying and they're begging God for revival. And, and there's a little break between the five o'clock and the six o'clock. And I went up into the pastor's office for a cup of tea, and I said, Pastor, I said, I, I'm I'm just amazed. I, I just don't understand this. Why is there this passion, this burden? And he said, Brother Ralph, he said, we know that the only hope we have is the Lord. You see, even since we were here last Sunday, uh, what did Kim do? He launched a missile this week right over South Korea again. They know that he's a madman. They know he's a God denier. And, and you know what? I, I, I came back and preached again at 6 o'clock and there's 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 people at the 6 o'clock service. Do you understand that one church, every church has prayer meeting in the morning, 5 and 6, but that one church had over 10,000 people at morning prayer meeting before they go to work, before they go to school. And on Friday evening, after they get off work and they get paid and they go buy groceries and they go out and get ice cream with their family, they come back to church on Friday night at 9 o'clock to thank God for a wonderful week to work and a wonderful week to have prayer meeting and that God's blessed them with the freedom to assemble. At 9 o'clock on Friday night, they start another prayer meeting. And I'm sitting on the platform and the pastor sitting beside me and uh, he leaned over and he said, he said, Pastor Ralph, he said, the, the main auditorium is full. We're going to open the first balcony. And they opened the first balcony. And he said, the first balcony is full. We're going to open the second balcony. They opened the second balcony. And he leaned over and he said, the third balcony is full. And he stood up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, through the interpreter to me, he said, ladies and gentlemen, the auditorium is full. He said, we're over capacity, almost 13,000 people in the building 13,000 people in the building. They're standing up and said, we'll have to be using our overflows. And that night they had their sister churches of like faith, 650 of them, the smallest church, seats a thousand. And when I got up to preach, they pushed a button and I preached in all 650 churches as well as that main auditorium at one night, just a little over one million people in church on Friday night thanking God for what he has done for them. Do you understand, ladies and gentlemen, the next morning I went to a prayer meeting and there I saw the choir crying as they were singing. And I asked the pastor, I said, Pastor, what are they crying about? And he said, they're praying for America. I said, praying for America? He said, yes, they're praying for America. He said, they are worried about you. They're worried about your country. You left the God that made you great. You've abandoned him. And, and just last week, Pastor, I had Dr. Billy Kim in Asheville and he brought the Koreans Children Choir and, and they sang for us. And, and, and you know what happened? You know what the handlers told me for the kids? They said at home, every morning before they go to school, they pray for America. They pray for God to send revival to our country. The children, the children, they pray for God and, uh, to, to touch us because they feel like we've left 
Psalm 78 that we are not living in that passionate faith that we used to have. And as you are here tonight, you think about people in another country praying for us because they think we've left our first love. I ask you tonight, will this be the class that makes a difference? Will you be the class that leads us back to our first love? Will you be the class that sacrifices personal pleasure? Will you be the class that begins to pray and maybe too fast for revival for our generation? Will you be the moms and dads of tomorrow that will tell your children that our God's alive and well and that we do not have to live in retreat? You say, but Brother Ralph, I'm in a storm. I'm in a battle. Well, always remember, you're not alone in the storm and you're not alone in the battle. And the whole process is that Jesus wants you to understand that you can have peace in the storm that you will not be left alone. And you need to understand there's victory for you. There's victory for the believer. The secret to the, the time with the Lord is that the storm is not in me. I'm in the storm, but the storm is not inside of me because I'm kept in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here tonight celebrating your graduation and God has raised you up to be found faithful that you'll be a generation of salt and light. I love teaching on the Mount of Beatitudes. I love walking around Galilee and studying in those cities that denied him and he cursed them. Bethsaida and Chorazim and Capernaum. I love going there and seeing that the word of God is still true today. And one of the recent archaeological discoveries, the actual city of Magdala, that's where the little boy with the loaves and the fishes, that's where he got his little fishes. You see the miracles even greater when you understand it in the custom. That was the only site around Galilee that had a brinery. And we found there the stone brine pits of the salt and they would bring the catches, James, John, Peter, all the guys came here and they brought their fish and there they salted them. There's no refrigeration. And the fish that the little boy had, why, it was sardines. It's the little sardines. That's what they cured there. And, 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 the, and the loaves, why, it was those barley where the mama would take a teaspoon and put it on a rock or a piece of metal of barley meal and make a little cracker. And God fed 5,000 with them. Isn't that amazing to see it come alive, to see the power of the Lord, to see the book living? And he wanted you to know that that's where he taught about salt and light, the salt from the brinery and the light of the city on the hill. That's what they fished by at night. That was their navigational marker. To this day, it's still there, that same city, salt and light. Why did he say salt? Why did he say light? Well, he said salt because it's a preservative. Why did he say light? Because that's your faith. And God said that when we become believers and we're followers of Christ, that we are to be a preservative for the community. Ladies and gentlemen, has anyone noticed that we've left God out and we're paying a horrible price? Amen. Did anyone listen to that rabbi at the, at the National Day of Prayer? He wasn't even supposed to speak. He was just a guest of honor with these two fingers missing that the man shot off as he came in to their temple. And there he prayed. And when he got up, he said, maybe it's time to get God back into the school. Maybe it's time to begin praying again in America. And I thought, well, but listen, you're right on target. We've paid a price telling God to go away. We've paid a price. Did you read that what the Supreme Court said when they said we should no longer post the Ten Commandments? Did you read the ruling? They said the danger of posting the Ten Commandments in school, in the public building, the danger is someone might read them. That's dangerous. And then if someone might read them, they may be influenced by them. Maybe they ought to post, thou shalt not kill one more time. 
We need revival in our country. We need to be that preservative. We need to be that. Whoever dreamed, whoever dreamed that we'd have a conversation in this country, that we would take a baby from the mother's womb and lay it upon her breast and make it comfortable before we kill it. What kind of country have we become? A country that has abandoned God and the priesthood has become polluted because now we've gone into religious entertainment. No longer Bible preaching and teaching, but we're substituting showtime religion for old time religion and we're paying a horrible price. This generation, class of 2019, we're counting on you to make a difference. You are the ones that need to be that salt and light. What is the job of that salt? It is to preserve. And what is the job of the light? It is to proclaim. The world is in turmoil. Korea just had another missile this week. Argentina is literally starving to death. The socialist nation, no water, no electricity, no food, no medicine, no health care. And they're crumbling and they're weeping and crying in the street and asking, will anyone help? China, the king of the east, is now in power and authority, moving around the globe, taking its money. We owe $22 trillion. China owes zero to anybody in the world. They have the money. They've got the power. And they're moving through the Middle East. They're moving through Eastern Europe. They even just made a deal with the nation of Israel that they would manage the port of Haifa. And you know what's going to happen? That's where our U.S. aircraft carriers dock. And ladies and gentlemen, this belt and road system they're putting in, I just stood in Costa Rica outside a, a, a Chinese military camp in Central America, right there in Costa Rica. Do you understand? It's around the world. There is no peace. There's no safety. Russia meddling in the election. But it's not only Russia, it's China. It's not only China and Russia, it's North Korea. And ladies and gentlemen, as we gather here in the last few hours, Gaza's on fire again. The inflaming powers have now taken a stand against the little nation of Israel. And God got Israel back in the news. And here you are. I never dreamed in my lifetime that I would hear an American president say, we're going to move our embassy to Jerusalem. But I just stood there in Jerusalem, and sure enough, it says, United States Embassy, it's been moved. And I left there and went to the Golan Heights, and now they've made the declaration that the royal land grant out of the book of Genesis is going to be restored to the nation of Israel. And as I was going to the airport on the West Bank, Area A, Area B, and Area C. Area A is the Arabs. Area C is where we have mostly the Jews in power. And they're going to annex it. Why? Because it is Judea and Samaria. Your Bible is more up to date than tomorrow morning's newspaper. You better look up. The king is on the way. You're alive to see it happening right in this generation and look what God did to you, 2019. He equipped you, he prepared you, and now he's gonna send you out into this world to be ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what you've got to have more than you have anything else? You've gotta have the power of God on your life. Fresh oil, fresh anointing. Our families, we've gotta pray for our graduates. Professors, we've got to pray for the graduates. Staff, we've got to pray for them. If it was tough when you went into the ministry, when you went into family, when you went into faith with people, think what it is for them today. We need to ask God to unite us for this generation. I want you to stand with me. I'm going to open this old-fashioned altar. I believe it's time for a declaration, a declaration as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Graduates, I know you're in robes, but you might want to come and kneel and say, at this baccalaureate service, I want to make that commitment afresh and anew. I don't want to leave the campus of Crown College 
without the King of Kings ruling and reigning in my life with new passion, with new urgency, and with a new burden for this generation that God would illuminate my heart that more than anything else, maybe you're going to be a lawyer, maybe you're going to be in medicine, maybe you're going to be a Christian school teacher or coach, maybe you're going to be a pastor or a missionary, but I promise you we need fresh oil tonight on the family of faith. Let's just open this altar. Mom and dad, pastors and friends that are gathered here, you feel free to join us in this altar. I don't know about you, I want to pray for my country tonight. I want to pray for God to send revival to my local church. I want to pray for our graduates. I want to pray together. I want to make that commitment. Let's pray together. Lead us in a hymn of invitation. Don't allow Jesus to pass you by. A night that can change your life. A night that can change your marriage. And if you don't know Jesus and Lord and Savior, this will be a great night to come. And one of the pastors here will take the word of God and show you. Page 176, lead them, Pastor.